Um, I want to welcome you to the panel about Lo-Fi Weirdness. We got uh, very special guests about to come up. I want to introduce Gerard Way, creator of Umbrella Academy. Movies will start to fixate on comics and steal all our stuff. <laughs> so I think the best way to fight back was to make comics even more bizarre. Because the one thing comics can do is weirdness and strangeness and surrealism. And they do that better than movies, they do it better than any other medium. So my big idea was uh, to start waving the flag for comics that were more like comic books and that had a bigger, higher level of imagination in them. And, uh, Hopefully some people have picked up the torch like Gerard has and starting to create these types of books. Because I think we just need more weird shit, to be honest, on this planet. <laughs> reprints came out, and I had read them when I worked at a comic shop when I was about 15, and uh, these Doom Patrol reprints came out again, and they had beautiful Brian Boland covers, and, uh, you know, I, I picked it up and read it, and I instantly was like, wow, how come, I mean, this is like, you know, 20, 30, probably even 50 years ahead of its time, and there's still nothing like this today, and so, I already loved Grant, and I went on the internet, and uh, I found this interview um, but it, it seemed to me more like a call to arms or something. Really, it really motivated me. It was the one thing that I read after I got clean, where I said, "This is what I'm going to do. Like, this is the next thing I want to do. I want to come back to this." And um, 
it was just so inspiring. If you guys find the interview, you should really read it because um, <coughs> you know, he was talking about the slow fi weirdness. I had no idea what that meant. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> Sounds good, though, yeah. And I, and it didn't I, exist until he, until he did it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, after, after I read it, I was like, this is what, you know, um, this what I want to do. I'm going to figure it out. I don't know what it means. I mean, it's always about interpretation, you know? Like, when we make um, records or something, you know, uh, let's say I wanted uh, the next thing we do musically to sound like the MC5, right? Or the Stooges, like... It's not going to sound like the Stooges of the MC5, but it's going to sound like what I think those bands sound like. And um, so his phrase, I interpreted that phrase to mean something so that shit, you know, that um, <coughs> unlike anything else out there. And, and, and he's right, it is, it is a form of rebellion to make something so off the wall that you couldn't possibly imagine a movie studio wanting to make a film like something like that. You don't write it for the film. You know, um, and that's what the crazy thing is now. It's like you dictate it, not them. Yeah, because there's so many people now. I think they, they started creating comic books that were actually just really cheesy pitch documents for movies that were never going to get made. And we really want comics to be comics and to do the things that only comics can do, which again is like really weird stuff. You know, and it's this time. I think the world's starting to change again. People are getting a little fed up. The last few years of you know war and terror, soldiers as heroes and soldiers as superheroes. You know we all love soldiers, God bless them. Those guys have got a hard job to do. But I've had enough of the soldier as the hero, the fetishized soldier. I want to get back to you know. <laughs> I'd like to think that we're emerging right now from a, out of that kind of post 9-11 time where we were really trying to deal with a lot of that stuff and it's time to start telling new stories and new kinds of stories that almost that give our culture some hope for the future because right now there's not a lot of hope for the future or so it seems but that's only because we're telling ourselves really shitty stories about soldiers killing each other. <laughs>
we, uh, they were originally the black orchestra, and then Gerard was like, oh, I can't do that, it's going to be too close to the band. And so, Chang came up with a different name, a weird name, <laughs> <laughs> Fixed the <coughs> But we wanted to not make it look like we were just doing what the band was doing. We both get these jazz hands. Yeah, we got jazz hands going. <laughs> Let's see everybody's jazz hands. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have a quick video set up for you. No, oh, you're making it weird. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead to the next question. I don't know what's happening. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> can you move on then? He's going to fully show you an aid on a drill. Yeah! <laughs> um, it, this, might, this might sound a little too uh, confessional for her. This, uh, <clears throat> thing, but, um, I've been in kind of a weird headspace here at the comm because I've seen like so many things around here that I want. Yeah. And it seemed that at the end of the Invisibles, you kind of came down to that whole Buddhist, Buddhist principle of just letting go of everything. It seemed King Mob had let go of everything and just was like, you know, yeah. he just had one thing that he was kind of focused on, and that was what eventually won the war. I was wondering if you could maybe comment on uh, on that idea of letting go of desire and. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a really good idea, you know, but it's, it's actually quite hard to do living in a Western capitalist culture to let go of desire because there's so many cool, desirous things hovering around you know, but it's something you actually have to do. You do have to disconnect, and those Buddhist guys are quite right about that because, you know, in the material world only brings suffering. Because no matter how many cool things you get, there's always one more cool thing you haven't got, and there's always another cool thing you haven't got, and there's always another thing dead. <laughs> so, you have to detach from that, and that doesn't mean that you go and live in a hut, it just means that if you've got a million dollars, you don't care. You know, it doesn't matter, you've got a million dollars, do something good with it, that's the important thing, but you've got a million dollars. If you work in an office, cool, you work in an office, you don't have to go and live in a cave. All you have to do is not attach to things in life, because those things will hurt you in the end. Everyone you love will either grow old, die, or leave you. <laughs> you know, that's the shitty world we live in, so it's really it's good to let it go. The Buddhists were right about that, and uh, if you can do it, you'll be a happier man, I'm sure. But like everyone else, you know, it's really hard work. It's hard work to let go of of wanting things. How's that working for you? Hmm? How's that working for you? How's it working for me? I'm just say on the same road as you, you know. I still want to go and see Batman again. <laughs> Letting go process until that last minute when you really have to let go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm a big fan of you, Grant. Uh, Thank you. And you're great. And uh, when you said comic books, for you, it's been a good way to express surrealist ideas, your strange and weird ideas. But if in some world after Hell Freedom is over or something, Somebody comes to you wanting to make a movie of the Invisibles or a series of it. Would you be interested in doing that? If they of course, because I, you know, if we have ideas, we want the ideas to get out to as many people possible. I like to talk to people. You know, I'm just for me, these things are like sending out signals, and the people who receive the signals are the people I want to talk to, and the people who send signals back to me. So if I can do that in a movie, yeah. I mean, I'd rather write it myself. You know, not some Hollywood nut job gets hold of it and turns it into God knows what. You know, but uh, no, I think. That if, if you want to talk, if you want to communicate to people, it's best to do it on as wide a platform as possible without losing your integrity and again, not really chasing the dollar on it, you know, having an actual agenda and something to say and people that you want to talk to. Does that answer the question? I don't know. Because um, um, you get a wide stage. Yeah, I mean, well, the part you said about, you know, not having an agenda and having something to say. That's the most important thing with anything, you know, and I'm sure uh, everybody here, when I ask Grant, because he wrote, he wrote a very um, ambitious description of this panel, and we, and we I'm like, how we? I was like, oh, you know, he goes, we sat down at dinner. He goes, like, no, we're gonna, I want to change people's lives. I want to inspire people, you know. Um, and uh, everybody in this room has some kind of dream or aspiration or something. That's why you're here at Comic Con. You believe in something, you know. And um, so, in doing that, everything you guys create. It, as long as it's pure, it has no agenda, it comes from the heart. You don't think about the video game and the other crap, you know. Um, it's going to be special. People are going to pick up on that. And, uh, if you do it like that, you'll probably get the video game and you'll get the movie because people come looking for it. But that shouldn't be the, 
the impetus like, for what you do. Yeah, that's not the goal. Um, so, and you know, and when Hollywood comes knocking and wants to make a film, there's that old great, I always misquote it, but there's a quote from an author and this guy from a magazine interviewed him and he said, well, how do you feel about all these directors ruining your books? And he's like, well, they're not ruined, they're on the shelf, they're sitting right there, like nothing's happened to them. And I think, at the end of the day, that's how we'll all, all feel about that. It's like, they can't take it away. They can't ruin it. It is what it is. It'll always exist that way as long as it stays in print. So film could, you know, completely bastardize what you've done, but it never truly will. You know, a comic is a comic. So. And it's also, I mean, one of, the, one of the things I want to say about everybody here as well, and your own creativity and stuff you may be into, you've got to remember like, in the entire history of the universe, like however many billion, six billion years or whatever it's supposed to be, you're the only you who has ever existed and ever will exist. Now think about that. Think about it. For your little span of 70, 80, 100 years, there's nothing like you has ever existed before or since. And only you see the world the way you see the world. And we want to know how you see the world. We want to tell, tell me how you see the world. We're trying to tell you how we see it in the hope that it helps. And at the same time, we want to hear what you've got to say because there is nobody in existence who is you. And no one can ever see the world the way you see it and can tell the rest of us how it looks. And it might be so different and so beautiful that it changes everything. Is you inspired yet? Grant, first off, just thanks for years and years of fantastic comics. You're welcome. It's been wonderful. Gerard, looking forward to years and years of future Grant comics. Um, I guess my question is actually for Gerard. Just, as far as the Umbrella Academy goes, and I think what makes this series work so well is you have such a rich backstory that you just kind of give it to us in just little flashes. And snippets. Right. And I'm just wondering if there are any plans to flesh that out more, especially like what happened to the horror, how did right. he die, what, what's that story? Well, the, the, you know, in some ways, the reason I think it's kind of postmodern is because the backstory gives the illusion of it having existed, but it doesn't at all. None of it exists until it's written. Um, each and every flashback and every scene. I, Scott, I think it'd be safe to say a lot of it isn't planned out. Like, um, yeah, there's a lot of possibilities. There's a lot of ideas about what it's going to be, but, but yeah, the Jennifer incident, we don't know exactly what it is. We pretty much know what it is, but all that stuff is in flux. It's one of the things, like, there's a similar thing going on in Hellboy where there's all this backstory reference. But we reinvent that constantly. Like, what, you reinvent it for what serves at the time. It's not written yet, so it's not, it's not the field. And uh, the Umbrella Academy, one of the fun things about it is it's, it is a, the comic itself is a bit arrogant. It almost assumes that you've read the last 200 Umbrella Academy issues, even though they never came out. And that's, to me, the most <laughs> exciting part about it. Is it. It has an arrogance and kind of a swagger to it, just like, and um, there's no real origin. There's no, who, I mean, who gets really disappointed when you have to go see that first superhero movie? Because you know that you're going to have to sit for about mm -hmm. an hour and a half of origin that you already know. Like, so in the costume for 20 minutes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't want to sit through that anymore. And you know what? People that aren't even comic fans don't want to sit through that anymore. It's, you know superheroes. We've been on this planet long enough to know what a superhero is. I'm not going to sit here and hold your hand like you don't know. You might know more than me. Like, so, the Umbrella Academy was written in that way, where you know what it is already. Even if you're not a comic fan, you know what a superhero is, you know what an origin is, you know what a secret identity is, you know? So it just kind of gets right into it. It cuts out a lot of crap and a lot of boredom. And uh, so, the cool thing about the universe is that it actually doesn't exist at all. And it happens as the inspiration comes. Yeah, it's funny, I was watching Zorro, The Mark of Zorro, the old Tyrone Power movie the other day, for some Batman research, and Zorro is really cool, he just rides in, like 10 minutes into the movie, Zorro appears, no explanation, no reason why he's called Zorro, no reason why he's wearing the hat, why he's got the sword, he just appears and starts doing, and fighting injustice. And so you think about that, if they were making that movie now, and I know they made a recent one, it's like you'd have to see why he chose the hat, why Zorro, why the fox, and it'd be, you know, 20 
taking minutes of just him trying to figure out what to call himself a fox and not the weasel. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't need that thing, Zorro just needs to come in right and slash everything up. <laughs> well, and you don't do that in other stories. Like in The Godfather, you don't have to see, like, you know, how he got the scar. You don't have to see all these details to enjoy the story, to know the character. Or like watching any kind of normal movie, reading a novel, it's not all about getting the origin, getting the backstory. You learn the character through the action that he goes through. And that's what we're doing with Umbrella. Yeah, and one, one of the cool things that I've started to notice now, too, is superhero movies are starting to grow up, and they're starting to grow. And now we've had enough of them where, where we don't need to do certain things. And that's what's really exciting now. Like, so you've had basically, and I'm talking about superheroes. I know there's been R-rated stuff like The Punisher or whatnot, but you know, the first superhero movie that, that's PG-13 is obviously The Amazing Dark Knight Returns. Is, I mean, that movie's phenomenal. Like, and that movie, and you know, obviously Keith Ledger makes that film in so many ways. So edgy and awesome. And uh, if that movie probably wasn't PG-13, there's probably a lot of things you wouldn't get out of that. And next year you have, you know, The Watchmen coming, which is the first R-rated. Less origin stuff. Getting it, you know, the public now knows, you know, like, if, if they ever did make an Umbrella Academy movie, the only way that movie will work is if it's the first postmodern superhero film. Like, it can't be, it's not X Men, it can't be friggin' Harry Potter. Like, <laughs> you know, um, it has to be a, like a postmodern film. And that's been any, it has to progress, it has to keep going forward. You know, um, less cartoons, less origins, just get in it. You know, and also it's been very literal, the whole idea of the origin and delving into the specific of why Batman wears those tights, it's really literal and quite weird, you know, it's very, it's like a society that's kind of really tight ass and has to everything explained. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's time we loosen their ass a little bit. Yep. Yep, hi. Drama, especially in a superhero story, which works on very high frequency and kind of high energy <coughs> all the time. So, you know, someone can't just stop their toe in a superhero story, they have to lose their head, and the entire cosmos goes with it. You know, so it's, all, it's on a very high hysterical level, which is why a lot of death and naming appears. But I don't know, I haven't done that much. I don't like to hurt superheroes too much. I like to trip them up a little and mess with their heads, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't cut off Batman's legs. The naming is my favourite part. You know, <laughs> kill, killing is so definite, but you can keep maiming them for a while. <laughs> you can keep them alive for months. You know? <laughs> You're welcome. Alright, this might sound a little weird, but I have a friend who's extremely bummed she can't be here, so can you just say a quick hello to her on the phone? <laughs> no. Yeah, you have the phone with you? Yeah. Okay, is she, is she on? I'll get her on right oh, now. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> Above. You have to go to the back of the line now. No, no. You're making it weird. <laughs> don't, don't make it weird. Okay, let's get another question while you're doing that. And once she gets on the phone, I'll just yell it through the PA. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Morrison, uh, Hi. I want to know how long, how long it took you to find the research for Invisible, because I'd like to see the primary sources for Invisible and the uh, Illuminati trilogy. Uh, could you say that last bit again? So, yeah, the research, did you say the primary sources? Yeah. I uh, my wife was the primary source for Invisibles Real. You know, I've read stuff like Illuminatus, and everyone should read that book by Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, for me, yeah, I was a big fan of Wilson and all those guys, and basically they wrote about their own experiences and what had happened to them, you know, 
I, I just drew upon stranger sources like Wes Anderson films, and you know, I wanted it to feel like a Genet film, or City of Lost Children, or Amelie in some ways, you know. Or, you know, I said to myself, like, what if David Lynch got to direct the X-Men, you know? <laughs> what would that be like, you know? Is it? And, um, so that's the kind of stuff that I drew upon, um, you know, but a lot of it, too, was simply being on the road, you know? And, like, I live with a family that is um, dysfunctional, but extremely functional at the same time. You, it's like you don't, you don't pick your family, and then when you're in a band, you actually kind of don't really pick your family either because you don't choose who you have that magic with, but you just have that magic with them. And, uh, but luckily for us, we're all friends in the band, you know, and it works. And that, that makes our lives easier, and it makes it e uh, much easier to make decisions that aren't based on getting paid because we enjoy the stuff. So we can say no to a lot of stuff. We drive it into the sun in a lot of ways, you know. And so I have something very special with those guys, and um, I was inspired by that. I was inspired by, you know, being in Moscow, being wherever. It all ended up in the comic. I, I met Grant because of the band, you know, like, just from traveling. We were able to have lunch. I was able to have lunch with Grant Kristen. I mean... In Glasgow? In Glasgow. Just sitting there. I think I even tried, what is that? What, that crazy... Haggis? Haggis. tried Haggis. It was good. Even we don't eat Haggis in Scotland. Haggis is the stuff we give to visitors. Yeah, I want to say this is our national dish. Like he was saying too, like, it, he's inspired by his own life, but there's bits of that in anything he's done, I'm sure. Like, there's bits of that in We Three. Yeah. Yeah. But also, you know, the weirdest stuff is real life. It really is bizarre. You know, one of the things I had to do for Patrol was a, it came from a story from a friend of mine, and no one could believe this. This girl had an imaginary friend when she was young, <coughs> and she got a little bit older, and the imaginary friend just kept hanging around. And she decided one day she didn't want the imaginary friend anymore, so she talked them round to the back of the house and shot them dead. And I said to her, so what are you shooting them with? And she goes, an imaginary gun, what else? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the real world, and the real world is much weirder than anything we can come up with, and I think that's why these stories come out of real experiences and real people that you've met. Because you know, some people say to me sometimes, oh, we don't need to your stories. I thank God help you. Wait till you're in a relationship. <laughs> Try understanding that. Thank you. Yeah. I uh, just have a question about, you know, about expressing feelings and helping people out. Is it hard to do this with being so famous? Like, yes, someone who wants to come up, film you, talk to people. You can't really go out on the floors. I don't know what you're doing after this. How do you actually get out there? You have to have a big crowd of people and you can't just, I don't know, is it not normal? It's kind of what you're, it's, you know what it is, it's kind of what you put out. Like, if you walk around like it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal, you know. Um, I, I still like to, I, I like to think I'm still as normal as possible, I'm still relatively the same person I was when I was 17, you know, pissed off about basically <coughs> the same stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not that hard, yeah, it makes it harder to like get one-on-one -on -one with people and, you know, back in the day it was really exciting because you meet like, you know, the craziest motherfuckers all over the country and, <laughs> get to sleep on their floor, you know, and these are people that are just insane, you know. Um, that kind of stuff doesn't happen anymore, you know, obviously. Uh, now we can have home and stuff. And stuff. Uh, but, um, I also try and thought. I do that a lot, by the way, man. What was your question? What, did, you have, did you have a part like B and C to that question? I can't remember. <laughs> are you going to be actually able to walk out? Oh, I have a little bit already, but I got so busy with having to do stuff that, right. yeah, like, you know. It's not, you're not able to do all these things sometimes. Though. Sometimes. And that's, that's, that is a drag sometimes, but, um. But you can do lots of other cool things too. Right, yeah. You know, but no, it's true, I mean. It, He's in a position where suddenly you have to have a bodyguard and stuff like this. I mean, yeah. think about that. <laughs> I'd love a bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> Just follow me. You look like you should have one, too. You know what yeah, I mean? She does. I, the first time I met Grant was when they picked me up for lunch. He's like standing outside like a Maserati or something, dressed straight up like a supervillain. It was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, all these kids were coming up and bugging him on the street, and there was no one there. He didn't have a bodyguard. Then. So I had to pretend to be the bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody fucked with me. <laughs> Hands off, Mr. Wade. <laughs> but you know what? It's weird because you know, these people aren't normal. Unless you're, unless you're Michael Jackson or something, maybe it's not normal. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of people in bands. It's just, it's 
guys, it's like your friends. One person to get to a point where lots of people have seen you on MTV and people project onto you things that maybe aren't true and that's what you have to be protected from is other people's opinions and ideas about what you are. Yeah, you, yeah, that's the big thing. You can't, you know, and we all face this every day in some way. You can't let somebody else define you, you know. One, one of the most interesting things about the internet now is that people that like are bands or famous or whatever, they're not even just the targets anymore. It's normal people. Like everybody's the target. Like everybody's watching you now. We're watching you, actually. I watch normal people on the internet all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Doing normal shit, you know, and it's... I'm laughing at them. It's weird. So, the, so now it's, you know, you're watching them, they're watching you, we're all watching each other. It's pretty creepy. <laughs> um, Hi. Uh, hi, I'm actually a really big fan, Gerard, um, and I know you had a really big inspirational moment for starting My Chemical Romance, which was 9-11. Did you have anything similar for Umbrella Academy, or has it just been ongoing inspiration? Um, it was, it was Grant. It was, it was the Doom Patrol. It was, it was his whole body of work, but it was Grant. You know, that was, uh, it was the one thing where I kind of got up and I was like, this guy makes me believe that I can do this type of thing, you know, uh, but it was getting clean, too, you know, getting clean was a big part of it, like, um, it's going to be, I think any day, it's like four months, four years for me, and, uh, you lose track after that, you know, and, uh, the coolest thing in getting clean and rediscovering Grant's work and doing this comic is I discovered that I was way crazier sober <laughs> than I was ever on drugs, so, um, so yeah, that was that was a big thing. I missed it. I missed it, and his work, you know, sparked something in me. And then Scott, meeting Scott, he was the perfect guy to hold my hand through it and just kind of he really just kind of shoved me into the ocean, you know. And uh, you know, we got we got into it real quick. We made it work. Um, but yeah. So what inspired that was uh, something definitely, obviously, a lot nicer than something like 9/11. That comes from a different place, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to say, do you guys ever find yourself identifying with your characters? Or? Well, he is. Yeah, I actually became my character. I'd killed my own personality when I was 30 and just became someone else to see what it would be like. And it was really kind of interesting. You know? I urge everyone to do it at least once in their lives. Kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. But in that way, you get back up again, like a comic book character. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think I identify with all of them. You know, they're all they're all me, and I'm all them and, and stuff. I think a lot of people think I'm I'm supposed to be more like the seance, but I'm, I'm probably more like um, like a number five, a little kid. You know, because I, he just hates the world sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've all got these different kind of personalities inside. There's, this, you know, there's one voice that tells you you're really crap, and another voice that tells you you're the best thing on earth, and another voice that's funny, and another voice that's authoritarian, another voice that's judgmental, another voice that's like a little sister. We've all got these things going on in our heads. So I think characters tend to just pick one of those voices out, and we turn them into a character. You know? But most most authors' characters are little fragments of themselves. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just want to say you guys are both Brad Gold and I love you both. But um, my, my question is for Gerard. Um, with like the success of the Umbrella Academy, do you plan on like writing any like established characters like Spider-Man or whatever? And um, can you be pretty pleased to sign my book? Of course, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I uh, yeah, that, I mean, the, the idea of that is very. What's your name? The idea of that, Matt, is, is very appealing. <laughs> you sure you can hear everything okay, Matt? <laughs> hey, actually, ladies and gentlemen, after that one, there is no autographs brought up to the stage. You know, yeah, the idea of that is, is really appealing to me, um, working on established characters, and I've been talking to people, and it's, it's all exciting, you know, nothing I can really say yet, but, uh, um, like, the Umbrella Academy is my home, Dark Horse is my home, and everybody knows that, and, um, and that's kind of why I chose them. I wanted a home base, you know, I wanted a home, and I wanted the Umbrella Academy to kind of be a safe haven for me, a place I could always go to, and that's kind of how I always think about it, and it was, 
it was, you know, the first thing I wrote like that that I was truly, truly proud of, and, um, uh, you know, it got me all the excitement I have today in comics from it. So, um, I'll never take uh, Royal Academy for granted. Um, but yeah, there's other stuff appealing, especially if I get to, you know, do really batshit things with them, and people let me do them. You know, um, who would buy a drug we bought one? Call me Hubbard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think if you, if you take a comic book character, like an established one, you start to get bizarre death threats for doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> Did we get murder threats on X Men. Uh, me and Greg Pack and a couple of the other guys went to some guy was really upset at what we'd done to Jean Grey, the Phoenix. And he was really in love with Jean Grey, like seriously in love with Jean Grey. <laughs> he was basically having a relationship with a piece of paper. But, uh, <laughs> so this guy lost it. He eventually had to send in the FBI because he was going to go up to Marvel Comics with a knife. <laughs> and just investigate everyone. So, you know, so a lot of people take this stuff really seriously, so you have to be careful. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I was just wondering if e each of you could collaborate on anything at all with one another, what would you choose to collaborate on? I'd make up something, we'd do something new that was just you know, how we felt a bit new. Yeah, we, we, I, you know, from, from, from the second I met Grant and we co went out to lunch that day, he said something really crazy to me, it was something that Neil Gaiman had said to you, right? It was, you know, go out and find the others, you know? Um, he saw, I mean, that was... Really no, it wasn't Neil, I'm sorry, it's a it was not to be, but it's, it's, it was Tim Leary, I couldn't remember, but, um, yeah, go find the others, and that's what Grant did with me, and that was the biggest honor of it, is he felt like I was one of the others, and um, I instantly, you know, started to get all these crazy ideas, like, wow, what could me and Grant accomplish together? We could do, probably not a comic, though, you know what I mean, like something crazier, like a film, or um, some nut job TV show, or whatever, you know, um, it's, it's crazy, we almost got... This is a cool thing. We almost got to make a video together um, for My Chemical Romance. We were going to do Mama as a single, and uh, Grant was going to play the devil. I was going to play the devil. I was and we decided, I wrote the whole treatment, and we were so excited about it. We ended up not being able to. I think the video involved um, us being chased by live wolves. <laughs> and then in a. Um, playing in a cabaret nightclub, <laughs> and then Liza Minnelli was the Virgin Mary. <laughs> and they budgeted it in the thing as like probably about $600,000. That demanded most of that. <laughs> <laughs> like it's such a great jacket as well, it's like the best devil jacket ever. <laughs> he already had his, yeah, he already had his wardrobe. So, uh, <laughs> so we were going to do that together, and I would have really loved just to kind of have that forever captured, you know. And there was this great scene where we were really, really close, and it was fucking weird, and we were yelling at each other's faces, and, you know, nothing like, picture the devil just kind of like, yelling at your fucking face. <laughs> <laughs> like you're both falling off a building together, you know. Like, that's what I wanted to feel like, just so intense, you know. Uh, but yeah, but I'm sure there's so many things we can do together, you know. I think, you know, it would be really fun, I think, to get together in, like, a friggin', like, a, a hotel room for, like, a week and just drink all the coffee we can and basically do what, like, Stanley and Jack Kirby did and just create the craziest fucking universe ever of total Silver Age superheroes, and I think that would be super fun, you know? I know, Grant, you're a big fan of just music in general, yeah. and I'm guessing Gerard is, but, um, <laughs> um, like, what were you guys listening to when you were, like, working on uh, your project? Uh, it depends which ones. I listen to tons of different things, depending on what the project is. Like Batman, for example. Yeah, it launches me off on Batman on the prose issue, which a lot of people didn't even bother to read, but... <laughs> On well, that one, I, that was written to uh, the Black Parade album, the entire issue was just over and over again, because it just came out that time, and I, just, I thought it was such a brilliant album, it was before I knew him, and it really it was the album that, that got me into meeting Gerard, you know, I really thought it was just a brilliant record, you know, way up there, it was Sgt. Pepper for the, for the death generation, you know, so, uh, 
that was on, do you know when I'm doing current stuff, I'm listening to a lot of psychedelia, old stuff and new stuff, because the stuff I'm doing now is a lot more psychedelic and a lot stranger. So, yeah, a bunch of stuff, you know, I'm trying to think of specifics. I always forget names of groups when people ask me what I've been listening to. Yeah, and, and me and Grant actually bonded on a specific song too because we both will repeat specific tracks over and over and over because, and I, and I talked to Grant about this and he's like, yeah, it gets you in a rhythm actually. Each, each issue, each series has its own vibe, each issue has its own rhythm within that series. And um, like there were specific songs like Tarantula by the Smashing Pumpkins. We were both writing each other and like, oh, I'm just listening to Tarantula by the Pumpkins on repeat writing this issue. And I was like, I'm doing the same thing. It was so weird. And the worst of it was at this insane moment where I've been listening to that Tarantula over and over again writing this Area 51 movie. And I turned the volume up so far up and stuck the things in my ears because I'm going to listen to this at full volume. <laughs> I haven't been able to hear right since. <laughs> never, never turn the dials up and listen to music. <laughs> it was horrible. It was I still hear it every time I lie down at night. That never goes away. Really. <laughs> um, so there's specific tracks, like the last issue of Umbrella Academy Series 1 was written to uh, the concept by Teenage Fan Club. I don't know why. That's a great, you know, Glasgow band, too. Um, this, you know, this record that came out in the 90s, and, uh, you know, you can't even, it's not even really imprint anymore. Um, uh, the other specific tracks, I'm trying to think of the other specific tracks. Uh, uh, Lady Tron, I've been listening to recently, a couple of Lady Tron things that really suit the kind of dark psychedelic stuff I've been doing. So, uh, yeah, they're good. <laughs> I think I was listening to the Ramones when I was writing the DHP story, the recent one. You know, yeah, so, so music does play a, a, a big part, but you'll, you know, it's interesting to find out that it's specific tracks repeated to create a certain rhythm in your head. And if that track stops for some reason, you take the headphones off, your rhythm is broken. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll keep stuff. Thanks. All right. Well, this is a question for uh, Grant. Uh, you are definitely one of the most important writers to Batman. Thank you. And um, can you just like elaborate on your inspiration for writing Batman? What Batman has in store for future? What you thought of the Dark Knight movie? Well, as I say, I mean, I thought the Dark Knight movie was great. You know, it's just it's so far cut above all the previous superhero movies. I think that changed the playing field, which is quite exciting. It was really beautifully constructed. All the acting was great. The story was great. The character arts were great. The action was great. The subtext was great. You know, it was actually it's just a really good piece of artwork. I thought. You know, so yeah, it was great. As for what's happened to Batman, well, we're killing them off. Batman <laughs> 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 well, IP is actually, yeah, that's about the death of Bruce Wayne. So. Uh, can you give us some uh, clues on how he's going to die? No, I can't tell you. You have to buy the book. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's really horrible. He dies by degrees. <laughs> Alright, thank you. Some friend I have. I finally tracked down one of my favorite uh, Doctor Doom stories, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, yeah. And he goes up and you know, screws us all out of any more autographs for the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's gonna be, right? You're doing stuff, That's right? Exciting. You're gonna catch him in the bathroom, man. We <laughs> 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 yeah, know, I know where he's going to My question for Grant is uh, what you have been planning on doing, like, and vice versa, of uh, what your art has done and get into music, or if you've already had that experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I started out in bands, you know, I, I came out of, of bands when I was a kid, I was a punk, and kind of, well, it was a kind of psychedelic punk, we were weird punks. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I came out of that world, I mean, to me, comics was just a way of, of finding a, a way to make a living without four other guys, <laughs> because we always fought, we just, we couldn't hold our band together, so I wanted to do something that I could do on my own, and I started to write comic books, but for me it was always, it's been about music and fashion and all that kind of stuff, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm still doing music, still making music, probably be some of it up on the website soon, so yeah, I mean, it's, that's another thing we share, convinces. There's a way to get uh, a hard copy of it? Yeah, we'll, we'll find a way. We'll just start doing stuff again, so I'll let you know. Check the website out and you'll see as it appears what, how we intend to sell it or package it. Thanks. Welcome. I just have to tell you, Gerard, you're a really big inspiration to me. I just recently quit drugs. And you, just, there's, you just really inspire me. And that's what inspired me to quit drugs. And I want to say thank you. Oh. And I also have a question for you. What has been your favorite part of developing a comic book? Working with other people, uh, uh, finding, like when you know when I started the band, it's like you get 
luckily Mikey is already my brother, so I already had one family member, I had to find other ones. And with the Umbrella Academy, it was finding a new family, you know, it was finding another family, ex expanding the family, whatever. And the first part was like beating Scott. And then, in finding that Dark Horse was, was already a family, and all I had to do was kind of embrace him and just walk into that. And then it was finding Gabrielle, and then it was getting Dave, and then it was getting Nate, it was having James do the cover. So that, that's actually been the best part. It's, it's been, and, the, and to completely prove a lot of fucking people wrong, that was so much fun. <laughs> but uh, but the, the people, that's it. And the people that meet, that read the book and love the book and know more about the characters than me. I think they actually, they do. I think they know more about them than I do. Yeah. Awesome, thank you very much. This has to be the last question. That guy went. Um, I was reading an interview or something about you, Grant, and you said you wanted to make DC sentient. How's that coming? <laughs> <laughs> just getting it, you know, it's sentient enough to start giving me a hard time. <laughs> start to talk back. No, that, was a, that was just a mad idea, huh? because there's always a moment anyone who writes anything or has ever written anything in a long form will find there's a certain point where the characters seem to take over. The characters themselves seem to take on a life and actually dictate how the story will go. Completely, yeah. They, yeah. they take it over. Yeah. So I figured there might be something interesting going on there because in nature there's a, there's a property called emergence which is the idea that the more complex things become, the smarter they get. So if you've got one bee, it's kind of dumb, but if you've got high bees, they're pretty smart. And I had this notion that the more ideas you put into something, the smarter it becomes. You know? So if you fill a story with ideas to the point where it's ideas, concepts, notions, things you want to explore, there comes a point where it starts to calculate for itself and the story starts to compute for itself and starts to decide its own direction. And I think there's, there's a certain, there's an element of some low level almost sentience in there where the story becomes self-aware. And it may be nuts, but there's something in it that I keep trying to pursue and that's what we're trying to do with DC Universe because you've got a history there going back 70 years. It's an actual place, it's a two-dimensional environment that you can go in and out of. And I think it has a, a, it has a it has an existence that's independent of this planet now in its own way, you know, even if we all die, this universe would still exist in vaults and in plastic bags all around the world. And <laughs> Superman, again, Superman will still be alive when I'm dead, even though I'm writing Superman right now. There'll be Superman, I'll be long in a grave, long dust, and Superman will still be around. So like I always say, he's more real than I am. Fiction is, in a lot of ways, more real than reality. You know, so I think... In, in So there's that, it was just it was a, a kind of mad notion I had to see if you could make something start to compute that had a, a higher level of coherence. Awesome, thanks. You're welcome.